Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Rancho Gordo, growing the best and most interesting heirloom beans available. Learn more at ranchogordo.com. This week on Meet in 3, we're embracing the spooky spirit of Halloween, from zombies to witches. We're exploring the odd, the occult, and the taboo in the world of food. There are restaurants with no storefront, shrunken down into hundreds of square feet versus thousands of square feet. No servers, no hosts, nobody taking your order. The rats in the sewers are now smelling, all of a sudden, fresh food molecules. And those rats were like, holy cow, follow that scent. Tune in to Meat and Three, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. I'm Aaron Sanchez. And I'm Sarela Martinez. And today we're going to talk about an extremely important ingredient. Uh, you could say the foundation ingredient of Mexican cuisine. We're going to be focusing today on the Mexican corn kitchen. And mom, who do we have here with us? We have a very special guest. Well, it's going to be a very specific Mexican corn kitchen because um, we have here Zach Wangaman who is from Oaxaca. I have known his father for a long, long time, and his mother, of course. They, had, they have this most spectacular bookstore in Oaxaca City that you can imagine. It's called a Tajin. Is that what it's called? Uh, Amate Books. Amate Books, exactly. I'm sorry about that. So, so that's how I know Zach of him and, uh, since he was a little boy and, and then coming over here to the Culinary Institute and then when he got up and this went to to uh, trail at per se, or you were actually worked there, mm-hmm. but I understand that before that you went and do did a little a little kick in with that on no. Yeah, at Centrico, you came in as an as an intern. Yeah, when I was sixteen, um, yeah. I was still um, trying to decide if cooking is what I wanted to do, and and that definitely helped uh, seal the deal. Oh man, well I, well, well, I was honored to have you, and we're more more excited to see all the great things that you have coming up, Zach. Um, you, you, you are t- you are taking on an, an enormous, enormous subject matter and an enormous task. Can you talk to me about your projects that you have coming up? Um, yeah, so uh, opening up a small tortilleria that uh, does uh, tacos and antojitos on the side. Antojitos being small apps that are um, focused around the masa, like memelas, empanadas, gorditas, sopes. Yes, yeah, so sopes. It's a very, it's a very big vocabulary and. It's always a little different from state to state, so it's about celebrating that diversity, but also, more importantly, celebrating the diversity of the corn. So trying to mill a different corn every day and telling and sharing the people what that corn is um, and sharing the stories behind it, not, not, not just saying, oh, it's blue or yellow, mm-hmm. but also saying, hey, you know, this is a Zapalote Chico from the Isthmus, and it, it harvests in within two to three months. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's just all these great stories behind corn that we're excited to share. Well, that's what we want to hear because this is what makes a, an ingredient come to life. Yeah. You know, I have, um, when I went to to Yucatan the first time, I was taken to this um, birthing ceremony by a healer. And there was a young girl lying on a petate having a really hard birth. 
So Roberta Loesa, who was the, the hero who had taken me there, got a handful of chili and threw it in her face, and the girls did a mighty sneeze, and the baby came flying out. <laughs> but they carefully got him and, and cut his umbilical cord over a perfect ear of corn. And that, that was called La Sangre del Niño. And at one time, that, that ear of corn was supposed to support him all his life. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? You know, the Aztecs were considered the people of corn. You know, they kind of lived their life around the harvesting of corn. Uh, can you talk, Zach, in specific about how you get your corn, what corn you have? You bought a beautiful array that, that we have here, different colors, shapes, um, and I would imagine, of course, flavor profiles. Can you talk a little bit about how you're sourcing your corn, how you're processing it, and how does it get to from the stock to the plate? This was actually... It was a big debate for me because I'm primarily a cook and I like to focus on the food. And as romantic as it sounds, going to Mexico and trying to source all this corn with all the importation laws. And then I started meeting all these wonderful people along, along the search that were just about passionate about the subject and more focused in that whole area of working with the farmers and, you know, going up there with engineers and helping them and giving them the resources they don't have, like soil analysis mm -hmm. and um, things like that. So I'm bringing my corn up with uh, a company called Tamoa, mm -hmm. um, which is a great company. Francisco Musi is the owner, and he's very focused on, on the land and on the farmer. And he's very worried about, you know, just having slow, slow growth and just growing the right way. Mm -hmm. like, but, like they did with vanilla, but I think the most important part about this is the fact is how benevolent and generous corn is because corn will adapt to whatever type of, of ecosystem that there is. You know, it, it'll go, grow in the desert, it'll grow in, in the high mountains, and you probably know, have a definition of which one grows where, no? Mm, yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing because um, corn needs human intervention to grow. Oh, that's one of the most beautiful things. If mm. if it just falls to the ground, it will overcrowd and not proliferate. I understand that it won't fall to the ground. It, it, it'll just stay on the ground. Mm -hmm. it, it, it needs a, a human being or a machine to get the kernels out of that. And and, and wonderfully, that's, that's what allowed the ancient Mexicans to be able to settle down because they found a crop that they could eat and they could eaten with beans and and squash it became a perfect protein. So corn is, you know, sacred to us because of, of that thing, because it's a symbiotic relationship. They, he, they need us and we need them. Yeah. Now, explain to us or our listeners the difference between what people associate with corn in America, like the sweet. In the United States. In the United States, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know, well, it's, a, it's a big difference, actually. Um, the corn that you'll find at your um, regular grocery store here is sweet corn. And like the name says it, it's very sweet, which means it has a lot of sugars, um, which are a starch, but they're a lot simpler starches, right? When you get other cor corn that's like better for tortilla making, um, you want larger um, starch chains, you know, which is kind of like what, what you would make cornstarch out of. It's what you would make polenta out of. It's right. what they use for field corn. Yeah, exactly. For the that's animals. Okay. And, but it, it, that's a, it's called flint corn or, or, um, or what is it? Hard corn. Yeah, it's hard corn. It has a hard starch. It doesn't have the soft starch that make, makes for those wonderful and, chewy tortillas. And that sweet corn, if you were to dry it, it would dry like a raisin because you think of all those sugars. Mm. That are in it. That's a very good that point. Just evaporate and just. That's like the indigenous people in the United States used to used to eat the corn. Yeah. And you can still buy it in New Mexico and places like that. So you have a lot of different varieties of corn here that you brought, all artisanal corn from Mexico, but they have different colored corn. Now, is it safe to say that they render a different color masa? Yes. Oh. Um, they do, and they. They change in color a little bit with the process, but depending on the amount of cal, because the cal can change the color. But if you use like very little cal, like for instance, in the purple ones, it really translates those like beautiful, bright purple masa. Wow. Or red or yellow. That's awesome. Yeah, and the taste is so different, you know, because Yira and, da and Jonathan always make tortillas, and some of them are yellow, and some of them are blue, and some of them. Yeah. 
and the flavor differences are astounding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, for instance, with purple corn, it has all the same antioxidants as like blueberries. Yeah, absolutely. Because of the color, so it's like all those same health benefits of yeah. antioxidants. This episode is brought to you by Rancho Gordo. Over the past 19 years, Rancho Gordo has led the revival of heirloom beans, taking the lowly bean from a healthy but neglected member of the vegetable family to a near superstar status ingredient. From growing the best and most interesting beans available to making sure all crops are fresh and a pleasure to cook with, Rancho Gordo's mission is to encourage cooks to experience and enjoy the unique flavors of heirloom beans. Rancho Gordo produces nearly 30 varieties of heirloom beans and lentils, as well as corn, grains, chilies, and other cooking ingredients. You can learn more at ranchogordo.com. That's R-A-N-C-H-O-G-O-R-D-O.com. So talk to us a little bit more, Zach, about yeah, the process. So you, you, you source your corn from this, this, this great company in Mexico. It gets to you. And what, what, what state is the corn in when you get it? Um, well, it comes in basically these giant um, uh, Ziploc bags um, <laughs> that it's important to keep it airtight. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's like it holds like 50 pounds of corn, um, but they need to be Ziploc because it prevents, um, you know, little bugs and stuff like that. And yeah. since they're not sprayed with chemicals or fertilizers, the airtight container is is a big key in the process. Okay. So... When it arrives at the restaurant, it has already been harvested, dried on the plant, and degrained. So the actual corn husk is actually, it, when the rainy season happens, right, then it, it, it's dry. They, they actually dry on the, yeah. on the, on the plant. Yeah, so fo- you, you basically follow the seasons of the year. In Mexico, you don't get so much the winter and the fall um, and spring and summer like you do here, you basically have the rainy season and then you have the dry season. So you harvest at, you plant at the beginning of the rainy season mm-hmm. and then the plant gets to evolve um, during the rainy season. And then the rainy season ends and then the plant matures and dries. Gotcha. So you get your corn when it's been plucked off of the, the actual cob and and then... It's been dried, plucked off the cob, and then you you get yeah. it at your restaurant. It gets degraded by the farmers and also sorted. Um, and so, yeah, then we get this corn and um, we cook it and we start this <laughs> very complicated process, complicated, simple process called uh, nixtamalization, mm-hmm. which is boiling the corn with um, calcium hydroxide. Cal, yeah. So. Yeah, cal. Um, in Mexico, they use what they call cal viva mm-hmm. in some parts, which is still in the rock um, stage, but once you add water to that, it, it kind of like boils. It goes through a chemical reaction and it turns into calcium hydroxide. Um, I don't think it's actually legal to use that in the states. Um, well, so yeah, so but you could buy it as calcium hydroxide in in powder in powder. But, form. but in ancient times, they used to use the uh, the sediment in lake beds. Yeah, and and um, especially like you were saying, you were in the Yucatan, and the Yucatan, the oldest source of nixtamalization was found in a pot and. Um, the call that they were using, the alkaline substance that they were using was um, seashells. Yeah. Wow. They were using so seashells. Cool. So, yeah, they, th- they think the first, the first um, u- usage of um, that alkaline solution was seashells. And they also use uh, hardwood ash. Yeah. yeah. And that's still used a lot in, in, in some parts of Mexico. Yeah, in for Michoacan. the corundas. You know, right. talking about interesting, beautiful things about tortilla making is near there in Guanajuato. They have these tortillas, which are ceremonial. Mm-hmm. And you you would put in your let's say a figure of a god or your or your logo, <laughs> and dip it into this bead like kind of dye, and squeeze it in the tortillas. Yeah, yeah. For all those who don't know, Guanajuato is beautiful. It's a beautiful place. To but do. you you know what you were talking. Getting back to nixtamalization, is you were telling me that each region has a different way of nixtamalization. Um, yes, I mean, it's, I think it helps also, I think one of the greatest blessings in Mexico is that it's very difficult to get to a lot of places. The roads are so bad, um, which still leaves a lot of places in, in isolation. And this is, um, you could really see this in Oaxaca. Um, you know, you think of Oaxaca has, um, 
you know, 16 different ethnic groups. Yeah. Um, and so each one has right. developed their own taste for their tortillas mm -hmm. and for the way they mix tamales and for the way they like their corn. And that also is important for the raw material because, like, I mean, for instance, in Oaxaca and the Valle Centrales, you make the tlayudas. Of course. Right? Um, which is a corn that is... You've, to make those big tlayudas, you need a, a starch or you need a harder corn. Yeah. I, th um, I thought it was the other way around. I, the soft corn is the one that gives you the big tortillas and the toothsome, wonderful feeling. Um, well, I think bolita is a little bit of a harder harder kernel, but there's, there's, um, there's a scale. And probably on the far end of the scale would probably be popping corn. Mm. And crystalline, and then in the other end, it'd probably be corns more like cacahuacintle, exactly. which they use for pozole. Well, you know, you yeah. know, really if, well, if it is because you squash the corn, and then when it's floury, it breaks up into flour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's get back on track here, okay? <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you, you touched upon you get your corn, you boil it in cal, and then what happens after that? Um, so you boil it in cal, and a standard recipe is one one percent. Um, of cal um, per the weight of the corn. Okay. And so you have to boil it, and how long you boil it for depends on the varietal of corn. Mm -hmm. If it's more floury, like Sarela said, it requires a much shorter cooking time than if it's a harder corn, it could take, you know, up to an hour. Mm -hmm. um, but you are basically looking for that al dente. Yep. Um, you know, just barely, like, you can bite into it, but it's not overcooked. Particularly if you're going to use it in a soup. Yes. Or a pozole. Yeah. And then so at that point, you, you've, you've cooked the corn in the cal, and depending on which variety of corn, it could take more time or less time. Then you let it sit in that liquid for a little bit? Yes, it's very important yeah. to let it sit and mm -hmm. um, really fully absorb, absorb the water. Um, this is actually, I think, I mean, this could be arguable, but I have big, a lot of big tortillerias that cook like 1,000 pounds of corn. Um, when they're cooking their corn it's so much that it'll overcook unless you have an efficient way of cooling the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they have to mill it immediately. Oh, um, so that really affects the flavor. Yeah, it's not as artisanal as, you know, giving it the time it needs to fully hydrate and yeah. soaking it overnight. But just the fact that you have the right corn yeah. is very good. You know, yeah. you, you were talking about the fact that a lot of these people are isolated, you know, in Oaxaca particularly. Well, that's one of the reasons that they've been able to to keep their native corns because c corn cro cross pollinates immediately. So when they start trying to bring this native corn here to the United States, and they plant it, it cr cross pollinates with the field corn that's here, and it and it loses all its properties or most of its properties. No. Mm -hmm. And um, I, a good way to see that is each corn silk is connected to an individual kernel. Mm -hmm. So if you see some of these corns that are multicolored. It's usually because the the pollen crossed over from one plant to the other and just landed on that one particular hair, yeah. which is sometimes you get the you know like the multicolored yeah. kernels. Oh, so that's now, interesting. So now now the corn's been cooked. It's been soaked overnight, <laughs> so it, it's allowed to flower. It's allowed to soak up and rehydrate. What do you do after that, Mom? Do you want to go on another tangent? So, we, <laughs> so this could take all afternoon. Uh, so so you you gonna you gonna grind it? Uh, is, this, is this now that you soaked um, it and cooked it? Is yeah, it time so, to grind? Um, no. Uh, this is a big, well, so what I like to do is I like to rinse it mm -hmm. a little bit because um, I still like a little bit of the flavor of the cal. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually go two or three rinses. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't like to rinse it at all. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like Sarela in Mexico City. It's not as a custom to rinse it because mm -hmm. it helps the cal helps you give you give you a longer shelf life, yep. which you definitely need in Mexico City. And it's such a big taquero culture that you also need that extra yeah. resistance from all the cal. Um, and in Oaxaca and some towns like Teotitlan del Valle, they take mm -hmm. pride in how white their masa is. Yep. So it's very little cal, and they they scrub they scrub the crap out of it. Yeah. Um, have, have, have you had that 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 masita? barbecue in Sole de Vega there or wherever no, Susanna Trilling lives. It's the most fascinating dish because it's like they put the, the cracked mix tamal that you're going to have it ready and then they put like a, 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 a dish with holes in it and then seasoned lamb on top and then cook it in the hole or, in, or, or steam it. 
So then all the fat and the flavors drip into the masita, and it becomes like this forage almost. See, that's a beautiful thing. Like, I grew up in Oaxaca. I was there 18 years. That town she's mentioning is maybe 20 minutes from my house, and I've never, I've never heard of it. Wow. Um, either I'm really ignorant or there's a huge diversity. Um, <laughs> I'd like to stick well, with I've this. Well, I've been to Tlan del Valle, and it's a beautiful place. Yeah. And I know exactly what you're talking about in that little region. Uh, so now it's been rinsed, the corn. Yeah. So what I'm saying, though, that's important is yes. what's right, it doesn't matter. What, what's important is that you explore, do you like it not rinsed, do you like it rinsed, and that you can understand the, 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 the differences. You know, it's not, it's not what's right or what's wrong, you know, it's... It's, 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 to, it's what to the like, gusto, yeah. you know, to, to your particular style yeah. or, or how they do in that region. Yeah, only, so, so only that, abuelitas, right, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So now, so now you're going to make it into a masa? So now it's rinsed. Mm -hmm. And it's been so, cooked and rinsed to, to your liking. And, and drained. Then, and drained. And then what do you do now? Um, so then we have to run it through the molino. Mm -hmm. um, and which is basically the best way to do it still is... I mean, I think by metate, but, you know, that would take hours. <laughs> um, so we use these machines that have still the volcanic rocks, and you can grind them. Yeah. So the metate being the flat the flat grinding tool that's used yeah. you know, for moles, but they also used to, I mean, to grind chilies, but also used to grind corn. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, it's not flat, because you could, that's a well, it has, yeah, it has like a little slope. Uh, yeah, it, it, it has a little feet. You know, uh, Montalban, um, which is one of the um, archaeological sites um, in Oaxaca, it was, I think it dates back to around 500 B.C., mm -hmm. and they were ex excavating it in 1931. It was like the, 1931 was a big excavation, and it was head by this guy, Alfonso Caso. Mm -hmm. And they had this lady there that was making them lunch, and they were excavating this beautiful comal. And this lady's like, wow, like, that's an amazing comal. Like, can I please take that home? But uh, that's like one of my dad's favorite stories. But I think it's so cool because you go from 500 BC to 1930, and it's like people are still using the same technology. Yeah, it has not evolved because it's such a proficient and beautiful piece of equipment. And a, and a system that, and there's so much pride behind people's tools, whether it's the metate or the comal. They're passed down to, from generation to generation. And some of them keep a certain metate, you know, for one particular thing. Yeah. You know, there's people that only use it for chocolate. Mm -hmm. There's people who only use it for masa. And then there, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there are other people who, who use it for moles because they want the flavors. You would ordinarily think that you would want all the flavors to combine, but but not there, you know, because you want the flavors to hit you at different times in, in, in your palate, not, yeah. not all emulsified you know so now we've gotten the corn and you put it to the molino or the gr a grinder in, in in english right or mm -hmm. uh so a way to break it down and process it and they can do it at home too because there's a, a, a place here i forgot it's a very well-known kind of old-fashioned instrument uh, equipment place that you get online and you can actually get a a, a, a molino yeah yeah it has like a tabletop attachment yeah, you just it. hand crank it that's yeah. awesome so now that you've ground it, now, so now you have, a, in essence, a live product. It's like your masa, fresh masa is something that is so, so beautiful at that point, right? Yeah, and I think the grind, uh, something else to mention is it can vary from what you want to use it in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for tortillas, you want as fine as possible. But for tamales, you might not. You might want it a little bit more martajado, they call it yeah. in Spanish. I, I think that's an important point to mention, Zach, because now... Like back in the day when you get something like a dried corn flour, like maseca, what you call masarina, it would be really kind of one grind. Now you see these these big companies that do maseca, or, or like maseca, for instance, they have different grades for tamales. They have certain masas that you can buy for specific recipes, right? Exactly. Um, but yeah, so you, mm -hmm. you grind it to, depending on your application on yeah. and what size. Um, and then it's very important to let it cool. Yeah. Um, because if you start adding water and hydrating it while it's still hot, you'll, you'll never know for certain the right amount of water that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to let it cool and then add water. And oxygenation is very good for masa. The more you mix it, the better. It's not going to develop gluten like wheat is. Mm -hmm. um, but incorporating oxygen into it does, I find, help for like a fluffier, nicer tortilla. Yeah, because if they, uh, you know you've made a really good corn tortilla if it fluffs up. Yep. You know, when we were at the ranch, I mean, I grew up in this cattle ranch in Chihuahua. 
And we, it was in the summer and, and it's holidays. It was always filled with cousins and 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 otherwise. And then other times it was just a family. We always had corn tortillas for lunch with a ta with asadero, and they would they would bring this wonderful mozzarella like cheese mm -hmm. to the table and, and squeeze it on the first on a wonderful corn tortilla with salsa that my mom used to make. Mm. But at night we always had flour tortillas. So, you know, the whole thing was to make sure that the tortilla would fluff up a lot and then toast just a tiny little bit, you know, the corn mm -hmm. tortilla. And we made masa every day, but I never thought of it. Yeah. Until lately, you know, it was because in the north you use flour more than you use corn. Yeah. So the masa is done. You've allowed it to aerate. You've allowed it to, to kind of get to that point. Now you can start to extrapolate that and start doing different uh, applications with it, right? Yeah, you can start making your tortillas and your sopes and your tlayudas, whatever okay. you like. So how long, what is the shelf life usually of fresh masa? I think it's important for our listeners. It, it depends a lot on the climate. Like you have a lot of very easily digestible starches in the open, so it, it will ferment very quickly mm -hmm. if left outside in warm weather, yeah. um, which is another reason why they add, you know, a lot of the cal in Mexico City is to prevent that because refrigeration isn't, you know, as... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, there, there are tamales that people like the masa agria. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you, you know, people some people like the soured... Yeah. Masa and it's for tamales particularly, and it's a, it adds a really nice tanginess. Yeah, you know, it's almost going bad, but not there. They're pulling it yeah. right before it will it will spoil. Yeah, it's delicious. Um, but I've kept masa in the fridge um, up to five days. Uh, is it as ideal? Um, no, um, it's definitely curious just seeing the evolution. Yeah. But I would rather I would rather press all the masa and save the tortillas in the fridge. Yeah, I agree. Um, I bring the tortillas back to life, you know. Yeah. I agree. Um, so, so we've kind of gone through the process of, of a nixtamal, how you get it from, from the, the, the kernel to the, the cooking process to pureeing it, I mean, to, to milling it or, or grinding it. Uh, Zach, can you talk a little bit about all the wonderful varieties of corn? Uh, you brought some here. Uh, you brought a beautiful array of different uh, artisanal heirloom corn. Uh, we know that there's 60 varieties of heirloom corn in Mexico. And in Oaxaca. The, and there's 35, oh, uh, yeah, you're 35 right, yeah. are from Oaxaca alone. So uh, can you talk a little bit about all that and, and the heirloom process and how these, these, these strains of corn are being rescued and brought back? Um, well, it's very cool because, as we mentioned earlier, it's all these areas of isolation, basically. So, for instance, earlier we mentioned the Zapalote Chico. Um, which is from isthmus. which is from the isthmus, um, and the isthmus region, uh, it, it's known to be very windy, mm -hmm. extreme winds, and so because of that, the plant has developed over time extreme elasticity. So the wind will knock down the plant, and then it'll bounce it right up. There's another one from the Mixteca called um, cajete, mm -hmm. which they they actually plant during the dry season, and when it starts raining. It comes up and it almost always gives a harvest. Mm -hmm. It's extremely drought resistant, and it also has these cool like air roots that are hanging from this stalk that attracts a nitrogen fixing bacteria that produces this gel. So technically, the plant has developed a symbiotic relationship with this bacteria that allows it to self nitrogen itself. Wow. You yeah, know, and this no, is all I this. Told you, it's a genius plant. This is all yeah, and this is all just product of hand selecting and seeing what you like, um, and, it's, and it's a process that's been happening for 10,000 years. Yeah, and, and do you uh, primarily utilize Oaxacan corn as a proud Oaxaqueño? <laughs> I am biased, but I am, <laughs> uh, and you know, I hate to admit it, but there's also some really, like Tlaxcala has some like really yeah. beautiful corns. Yeah. Michoacan has some really beautiful corns. Of course. I'm trying to keep an open mind. Um, <laughs> It is an orgullo, you know, you, for your for where you're from, and I think that's beautiful. You know, one thing that you brought up to me, and, and I and I actually questioned, and I said, where did you get this information? Because he was saying that in ancient times, it was the women who developed the the corn, because they because they were the ones who were cooking with it and everything, and then they said this works, that doesn't work, and so I, I said, where did you get that information? Because I haven't read it. So then he quoted it back to me, and it was like a Mexican archaeological. Thing that I, which I take with a grain of salt, because they don't always do the 
You know, the back where, yeah. But it's true because um, the women were the ones that used to select the seeds, and they're the ones that used to cook it. Yeah. So because they were cooking with it and they were like, oh, this is too hard, whenever they saw seeds that were maybe a little softer, those are the ones, you know, they gave back to, to plant for the next year. So I, I definitely do think domestication of corn is mostly attributed to women. Absolutely. It's also, you think about it from a spiritual standpoint, it's like, you know, women give life. You know, yeah. they're giving birth to the corn as well. I think there's something to be said about that. Well, you know, that's, that's a very Mexican kind of thing, particularly if you go to a house, a poor house. People will always say, déjame echarte una tortilla, especially in the north. Let me make you a tortilla. And when we were at the ranch in the summer, as I said, all my cousins would descend on there. And we were, and we would, I would lead them in the morning in, on horses, you know, with a, a rain cave in the back because it would, if we were lucky it would rain. And one day we came upon one of the estancias, one of the outposts, was where one of the, my comadres was there. And, uh, she, you know, it was wonderful how the Mexicans greet you practically universally. They, they, they get there and they get a pot of water and they start putting on the dirt floor if that's what they have. They get a twig broom and they sweep it all up. And then they get put the chairs like kind of in a circle, get a rag and start cleaning it like that. Mm. And she says, well, you didn't let me know you were coming. What am I going to make for you? And she, she thought about it and she said, I'm going to make you some enchiladas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna make the tortillas myself, which of course it had to there. And, and she said, but I'm gonna puree the chili with my hands so that my essence is in there in this dish, mm -hmm. and that is gonna be my gift to you. And that is, it usually starts off with a tortilla. That's beautiful. Thank you. And, I, and I think, I, I would like, Zach, for you to talk a little bit about the current state of corn uh, in Mexico and how that's affecting. Um, the way that corn is coming up north across the border, because I know I, I recall I forgot when it might have been Peña Nieto who was president and he priced the, the corn very high and it was one of those things that even the poorest of person in Mexico can afford. It was Felipe Gortari. It was Gortari that even the the even the poorest of person in Mexico can always afford masa to make tortillas. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the about the crisis of corn? Yeah. Um, well, I think corn, as we can find it, is basically we can divide into three big categories. One being um, the heirloom corns, which are the ones we're working with. Two being hybrid varietals, and third being transgenic. Um, transgenic is when you have to, you know, chemically implant a gene from another species, not necessarily a plant, into the corn. And hybrid is when you use different varietals of the heirloom ones or of to cross-pollinate to try to control and create more standard, like same height, same, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the farm that – that's like usually the the farming style that promotes uh, monoculture yeah. and things like that, which I'm not really a fan of. But it's also what we need, you know, to so that everyone can can eat. So I don't necessarily see hybrid corns as a bad thing. Um, I think what is important, though, is these heirloom varieties that gave birth to or helped give birth to a lot of the hybrids um, are getting forgotten. And not forgotten by us, but forgotten by the farmers. Because the farmers, they don't really realize the diversity there is. They don't, I don't think they really realize that they are the guardians of these seeds yeah. that them and their ancestors have been planting for over 150 generations which is amazing. So it's like when people go up to these farmers and they're like, hey, you're growing this amazing things and you need to value it yeah. because you and your family have, you know, created this culture and, you know, it's not just an ingredient, it's your way of life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it's difficult. Way of life is is hard. I think the average income for a, like an, a small farmer there is 3,000 pesos a month, which is like wow. nothing, you know, Coca-Cola is cheaper than water, so it's like the kids have diabetes yeah. at like 12. You know, um, sometimes companies will come in and they'll try to, like for instance, the one I mentioned mm. that has the nitrogen fixing roots, they'll try to create bio patents, you know, to, to make, a, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems out there. Um, but what, didn't, didn't Toledo, the marvelous artist from Oaxaca, lead a big... Uh, movement and they were able to keep Monsanto out of Oaxaca? Uh, not just Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, it's legal to buy 
um, transgenic corn, but it's illegal to plant it still in Mexico. And every year they try to get in, and every year um, this community gets together and fights them off. And Toledo was a big supporter of that group. You know, he, yeah, he's did, yeah, he sadly passed away. Um, did, did, last you, year. did you see what I bought? That that marvelous piece. It's a an ear of corn, all dressed up in its beautiful leaves and everything, in a sarcophagus. Yeah. Because it, oh, yeah. it says something about the death of corn. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about these varieties of corn, these heirloom varieties of corn, and we're losing them a lot to the open pollination of GMO, uh, GMO, GMO corn, right? Yeah. And that's a huge, a huge deal. It's a political issue. It's something that really affects so many people. So I think you're doing something very valiant and very important, Zach, by preserving these beautiful heirloom varietals. No, and make it a reality because no, nobody is doing anything about with these products right now. You're going to get a lot of press. Everybody's going to follow you. You're going you're gonna to be able to change how corn comes in here to the United States because there's going to be such big demand. You know, right now, most of that corn goes to liquor stores. 85% of the corn that comes in of the native corn goes to the whiskey makers. Yeah, the whiskey makers, yeah. Thanks to Macienda. Yeah, we need to, we need to step up and, and, and chefs and, and, and artisanal cooks need to go back there and rescue that corn and make sure that we're, we're, we're this is the standard fresh masa should be everywhere. Yeah. And yeah, just sharing those stories about the farmers and helping them bring awareness so that they don't, you know, that's, that's a good, that's a good way to solve immigration. It's like they, they you know, they come here, they'd rather pick strawberries in California than harvest their own, you know, beautiful yeah. corn. So it's like, I yeah. think help, you know, helping them cheer them on in that way can go a long way. And I was also uh, like while I was doing my travels and research is it was great to come across a lot of people that are putting a really big fight not just Toledo but a lot of really young people and can you and can you mention some of those people because I together. know that they're they're very important yeah so like um, for instance Rafael Mier is a big one he has a, a oh, foundation yeah, that, called Fundación Tortilla mm -hmm. he saved the tortilla yeah he does great things like you know He's trying to pass laws that are saying, hey, it should be illegal to put purple food coloring in masa. He's trying to pass those laws that and create those conversations that, mm -hmm. oddly enough, haven't been created. Um, you know, there's Flavio Aragon, who uh, works in the INIFAP from Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And um, he's been at this for almost 20 years. And I think it's really cool that he just he's been going at the farmers and like what we're saying, just promoting their own prop their own corn to them and mm -hmm. teaching them basic science to like prevent cross pollination. Maybe the neighbors, you know, mm -hmm. planting GMO or a contaminated seed and how to help keep your varieties as pure as possible. Yeah. And yeah, he was doing it. Imagine 20 years ago on a government salary, it requires, it requires mm -hmm. a lot of passion. Yeah. You know, we have, I think Sarela's friends also, Jonathan and Gira Barbiere, mm -hmm. they're doing a great documentary. And Fulvio, and Fulvio Cardi, my friend, yeah, yeah, Fulvio. Many years. The, the, the master of, yeah. of all that. Well, I have, to, I have to be a little irreverent. Okay, when I first moved to New York, my friend Diana, who sadly passed, and uh, was going to introduce me to this, I can't remember his last name, his, Stan, his name was Stan, he was this amazing artist who did light boxes. In any case, he died of a heart attack, and then two days later I got a note from him, it's an article from uh, one of those uh, rags that they have at the supermarket, and it said that Jesus Christ had, a, had appeared in a tortilla. So they were making a whole big thing. And then it says, you know, people came from all around to adore the holy tortilla. <laughs> okay, Mom, that was nice and creepy. No, no, it wasn't creepy. <laughs> it's, hyster it's hysterical. It is. And what I'm saying is that it gave a lot of press to the tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so, Mom, let's talk a little bit about how do you use the, tor the, the, the masa? Let's talk a little bit about some recipes or some different ways to use it. It would be wonderful if you could do some of the vehicles for ap ap appetizers, you know, sopecitos, gorditas, that people could go buy to entertain at home. Yeah. You know, like little picaditas and everything that people could go buy. And, and I think that that would be doing a great service to the catering business in, Dina in New York City. It would enrich it so much. Absolutely. And a lot of those are... Um Enhanced with a uh, manteca, which you know yeah. not only tastes good but also helps a lot with the with the shelf life and yeah, things absolutely. like that. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, you don't worry about it. We're going to do a, a program on lard. Praise the Lord! But next yeah. next season. Well, I mean, let's just talk about like the simple tamale recipe. You know, let's talk about how how someone buys masa from your from your establishment, Zach. 
they take it home, they soak the corn husks, they want to make them out. How do you how do you go to that process? Well, see, the problem is that people are not going to make it the right way because, first of all, they're not going to want to use lard. And if you don't have lard, you cannot really make a good tamad because every every fat has different sized crystals. Mm-hmm. So, ma- so lard has very big crystals, and if you beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it, when you steam them, all the fat dro- comes out, and all you're left with is this fluffy, wonderful masa thing with some delicious filling mm. in, 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 encasing, you know, in encasing some wonderful f- f- uh, filling. It's very simple to make, actually, because you're going to beat one pound of lard until it's like airy, 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 and then you're going to add three pounds of masa little by little mm-hmm. because it should be one to three. Uh, ratio, and then after that you're gonna put plenty of salt because and when I always do things, I always test the masa. Mm-hmm. You know, I get a little ball of the masa and put it on a on a frying pan to make sure it's got the right amount of salt. Absolutely. Yeah. So then, so then that's so that's that's how you make a tamar dough, and then you just spread it on soaked on soaked corn husk or banana leaves. And, and, and steam it. And, and steam it with with a delicious filling in it. Yeah, and, and then, or not. Yeah. Is there anything that you, you feel that we need to cover, uh, Jack, that, that we're missing here as far as corn and its evolution and its origins? I mean, I think it's definitely a very uh, big subject, and it's something that you could definitely go on and on about it. Um, I think one of my favorite things that we didn't really touch on is the idea of milpa. Yeah. Um, Let's talk oh, about yeah. that. That was the a milpa. book. I yeah. bet that I helped get the money for. Yeah. So yeah. So the idea of milpa is a pre-Hispanic way of agriculture, which means you grow the corn, and then the squash, and then also beans. And the idea is that the beans nitrogenate the soil to help the corn, and the squash spreads out and helps prevent weeds. And then there's also some some weeds that are actually incredibly healthy for you. Um, gelites, they call. Yeah, of um, course. Well, that's in that's very that's very interesting, you know, because in Veracruz, you know, there's like borders on seven states. So then it, uh, so there's seven different cuisines, and all the the food of the mountains is a lot of greens and uh, greens that you don't find. But we actually we're going to cover this tomorrow. So I think one of the, my favorite things to do with masa that isn't very common here is to use it as a thickener. Mm-hmm. Um, for like moles, like for instance, mole amarillo. Yeah. Mole amarillo is m- one of my favorite simple sauces, which is just uh, toasted chilies with a little broth. And um, it depends on the protein. A lot of times, hoja santa, yeah. which is um, very like root beer flavored. Um, and you just blend it and you shear in the masa mm-hmm. into the blender. Or I mean, chili atoles, yeah. from, chili atoles. From, from Veracruz. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Corn is. A subject that you could do a whole podcast on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a huge thing. So hopefully we'll be able to touch on different kinds of things in subsequent programs as well. Yeah, huh? Zach, um, could you give uh, our listeners a way of contacting you, keeping up with what you're doing? Uh, is there a website? Is there an email that people can reach out to you? Um, well, yes. You could always reach out to me at uh, Zach at Sobremasa.com for email. And then we're also on Instagram. At Sobremasa. At Sobremasa. At Sobremasa is probably the best. Okay. And if you want to read everything about corn, I wrote a 4,000-word article for the Daily Meal on corn where it's called In Mexico, Corn is Life. And if you go to my website, I mean, that, that, te- that, that talks about how corn is used in all different kinds of things. That's what I'm saying. That it's a huge subject. Yeah. But in my website, I have tons of recipes for masa, for everything else. For, so the recipe for today was the, the masa for the tamales. How about that? Yeah. Well, Zach, uh, we're beyond grateful for your presence and sharing your knowledge. And we're going to continue to support you and be there for you. You're doing something that's so admirable and so necessary. You're, uh, you're, you're preserving a, a way of processing corn that is 10,000 years old, and you're making sure that people, are, you're sharing that with a huge audience. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I'm Aaron Sanchez. And I'm Sarela Martinez. Please keep tuned for our next podcast of Cooking in Mexican from A to Z on Heritage Radio. Thank you. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. 
Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.